Dr. Kalum Gamage, Director of the Postgraduate Institute of Management, Professor Ajanta Dharmasiri, <coughs> Professor of Management and former Director of PIM, Mrs. Sriani Lianage, Ms. Chaturi Lianage, Mr. Erdli Pereira, Mr. Dehan Senuratna, member of the Oration Governance Committee, Mr. Denzil Pereira, president of the PIM Alumni Association, Mr. G.S. Sylvester, representing CIM members in Sri Lanka. I born and a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a singular honor, and I stand humbled today upon the invitation that I received from the triumvirate organizers of this memorial oration to share some thoughts, some learnings from around 25 years of progression of consumer-centric marketing in Sri Lanka. What I will talk about today may seem obvious, it may seem trivial to the August audience to whom I'm speaking today, all experts in marketing, which I'm not, though Mr. Adli Pereira very kindly bestowed that honor on me I certainly don't consider myself an expert in marketing. But maybe where I succeeded was in selecting and bringing together people with capabilities much greater than myself, who in concert as an orchestra were able to create a business in Sri Lanka which has taught me many lessons. And what I shared with you today are some of those lessons not necessarily in coherent sequence, but a set of lessons which might, when put together, give us some meaning and some ambition, not only for the present, but also uh, for the future. Many of the ideas uh, which I will talk about have been debated, discussed with Professor Udita Lianage over the years. And it was an equally humbling experience to be in his company and to bounce these ideas from time to time. It was also an honor for me to join him on several occasions to share thoughts and engage with the students of PIM. And that I treasure as both a memory and as a learning. Today, I intend to talk about inclusion, a, fav a much favorite topic of mine, but also of Professor Udita Lianagi. And in particular, I want to try and bring together the nexus of inclusion and value creation. On one hand, that warm feeling of including, of plurality, of equity, of social empowerment, and on the other hand, the hard-nosed concept of value creation in business. I believe the best way to introduce the concept of inclusion is to think about the opposite, and that is exclusion. And I believe the exclusion formula can be summed up in a few words, as in the make that as in making opportunities and products and services available to those who can afford. In contrast to this, where you're making opportunity available to those who can afford, in contrast to this, the philosophy of inclusion is the converse of those very words, that very sentence, making the opportunity to experience available and affordable to as many as possible. These are lines which the team and myself thought through together some 25 years ago and scribbled down, debated, 
and used as foundations for the structure and construct of the business. There are also lines and concepts which many of the PIM students who are now business leaders would have seen before because these very lines are those which I would have discussed with them. And I have taken the liberty of echoing and repeating because I think that is where the learning has come from. So the reality with respect to dialogue, and let me switch back to the dialogue story for a short while, and I'll come back to it at the end, just to tie the pieces together. The reality at that time, in 1997, when I uh, took over as CEO, very, very inexperienced, and given the task of leading dialogue, the fourth entrant, uh, the last entrant, and number four mobile provider in the country. Significantly, the provider who had the weakest product. Not the strongest product, but the weakest product. And the team and I set ourselves this ambitious, audacious vision to be number one in three years by the turn of the millennium. Now, when you set yourself an audacious goal, and the, uh, the thought of and the concept of competitive advantage is again something Professor Udita Lianage used to dwell on in terms of strategy. The first thing you do is to search for competitive advantage. You're setting off on a race. The first thing you need to do is to ascertain, to believe, to find your competitive advantage. So the first approach would obviously be to do things better than competition. Look at all your competitors' skills and capabilities and just do things better. But we were so far behind at that time. And I think that is a blessing. It's a luxury to start off in a market so far behind the leaders that you do need to think of doing better things and to create a blue ocean for yourself. And this is when we realized that the value creation construct of our competition at that time, and those of you who were old enough at that time to be interested in the mobile market would recall that the mobile phone and the usage of a mobile phone, apart from its cost, was also positioned as an exclusive experience. And in a value creation construct based on this exclusion formula, you would start as a business person, as a financial person, as a business leader, you start with your cost of production and then you define your minimum return. You decide, I am going to make X percent margin at minimum. From that point, you are excluded because the moment you set yourself a margin, you're setting the boundaries of inclusion. You're excluded. And based on this minimum return, you will size up your market, you will size up that affordable segment as they call it, and decide that the volume that you can address over the next five, 10 years is dependent on those who can afford the, your cost plus your margin. And therefore, you end up with an affordability constrained business plan. And in a sense, it also is constrained by your own belief about productivity, efficiency, and your internal capability to reduce cost. So in searching to do better things, not copy the competitor, but to look for a better way, a better set of things to do and excel in, we asked ourselves that fundamental question, which I ask myself even today on a very regular basis in whatever business I may be addressing at that point. What business are we in? That shakes your foundations, it shakes your fundamentals, because you're questioning the one reality that you should be assuming is fixed. You should know what your business is. But if you question even that, then it opens your mind to who your competitors really are and to what your real resources are. And this way, we were able to zero in on a very motivating for us in the fourth place in that market, with a product weaker than our competition, with capital constraints, 
facing all near bankruptcy. It was a very motivating view of our resources that there were 20 plus million people in this country and these people, this population had needs and aspirations to communicate. They had a desire and a love to speak. And when you combine these people with these needs and aspirations, you come up with an inclusive value creation construct, which to use one of those dirty business words to exploit both these resources. And from time to time, I will use both the business lingo and the soft social inclusion lingo. Because unless these two exist together, the inclusion value creation construct cannot feed each other and be sustainable. So based on this, in contrast to that exclusion-based value creation construct which I described, we formulated something very different. We start not with the cost of production, but we start with the, re the resources we have, population and need. That should create and define your opportunity. So the opportunity is to connect this entire population, whether it takes 5, 10, 25, 30, 50 years. The opportunity is to connect. And then you use the available technologies, you use the available capability to address this opportunity. And therefore, you build a business plan which is both high volume and unconstrained by affordability or the market size that you might have perceived if you started off with your cost of production as the first input. And then when we returned to this question of the business we are in, having conducted informal as well as formal market research, chatting to people across this beautiful country, from across students, service person, personnel, businessmen, CEOs, children, mothers, from the north, from the east, from the south, what we realized was that there was a phenomenal demand, opportunity for a socio-cultural thrust to bridge a divide. To bridge a divide, to speak to each other freely and at will. And we realized that the bigger mission here was at least in our area of business, that we couldn't do it for every sphere of life, but at least in our sphere of business, that the real mission in front of us, the real opportunity, was the business of delivering equality in communication, in connectivity, and thereby to bridge an existing divide, to give wing, wing to aspirations that people have, making a difference in their life and enabling a platform for equality. And I still remember through those focus groups, when asked, a trader on the street, university student who had no hope of owning a mobile phone at that time. When asked that simple question, would you like to use this? The answer was a passionate yes. And that's all you really need. Because that is aspiration and desire and need. Add it to population, multiplied by population, and you have the definition of your business. So we had the market choices, just to sum up, between being exclusive, to define a market narrowly based on profit targets, to harvest it at saturation, and create value through product variations, if at all. Or to define this market wide and deep to maximize new adopters, first-time users, people who had never seen or heard of the product that we were bringing to market, and create value through rapid volume growth. The answer is obvious, and the rest is history. But we did write down at that point a hypothesis that went beyond our immediate context, that those who deploy technology in South Asian or developing country markets should adopt an inclusive philosophy, not to succeed and be champions, 
but to survive. And ladies and gentlemen, why this word survive is there was because that was our primary thought at the time. Yes, we had a vision of being number one, but our first objective was to survive. And even to survive, you need to be inclusive, in my belief. So flipping back to the theory and construct of inclusion, leaving aside that dialogue story for a while, and thinking beyond the fairly obvious dimension of affordability, we need to also satisfy several other dimensions in order to create a construct of inclusion. Availability, fairly obvious. The immediacy and reach of the product. Applicability or relevance. What you're supplying to the market, to the consumer, needs to be relevant. Importantly, affinity. And this is something linked to feelings, to trust, to aspiration. What this product, the service, the meaning of what is put before the Sri Lankan consumer that it has a cultural connect in some way. It could be through brand, it could be through personalization, it could be through experience, or it could be something far more fundamental. And this is where, flipping back to that first of the four A's, affordability. Another lesson I learned from very simple phenomena in the market at that time in a sphere, nothing to do with communications, the sachet. The sachet of coffee, the Nescafe sachet, the sachet of shampoo, the sun silk sachet, just to give a few examples. At the beginning of this journey, I didn't even stop to think of what this sachet represented. Because to me, I, at that time I should travel abroad occasionally. I used to see these sachets in the hotel room, and I assumed that the utility of this sachet was to enable the hotel to give out coffee free of charge to its clientele without having to break open a bottle of coffee each time. And subsequently, I started carrying some coffee in sachets myself, because being somewhat of a coffee addict, I needed coffee at short notice. And the utility to me was simply convenience. But the utility, I later realized, the utility to someone in a rural village in Sri Lanka of being able to buy Nescafe, that premium aspirational brand, and to serve it to his most honored guests or her most honored guests, the utility was joy because that family could not afford a bottle of Nescafe, but they could afford the sachet. So how this sachet is perceived would vary across the socioeconomic segments. And the same goes for sunset. And I'll come back to that shortly. But why a sachet? It's that when you understand the Sri Lankan consumer, or for that matter, any emerging market consumer, and I dare say over 25 years, I. I would even go as far as to say any consumer, because consumers are becoming far more rational and far more fine and sharp in their thinking about these concepts. Not making commitments. Broadly a no commitment psyche. Consumers are moving away and at that time, 25 years ago, the context for our industry was postpaid and prepaid. Postpaid had commitments, prepaid did not have. Affinity to cash and liquidity. Investment bankers today value companies based on cash flows, discounted cash flows. But our Mudalalis valued business opportunities by cash flow 25, 50 years ago. They would go for something which reduced the gap in time between payment and consumption. And our consumers also would value a product which is presented in a form where the gap in time between paying for it and consuming it is minimized. And the variability in cost relative to volume, quality, and spend per period. 
meaning that the consumer wants to be empowered and given the choice to use as little as he or she wishes at a quality which he or she determines according to his or her wallet and the amount of money they would have to spend for a week or a month or a fortnight and so on. So I believe the concept of the sachet is central to the concept of inclusion. More on the Sri Lankan consumer, and again, one of Professor Dita Lienige's favorite topics. And this kind of overlaps with his work on the hybrid consumer. But here I have actually split the hybrid consumer. And I believe that in most emerging markets, and certainly in Sri Lanka, you have this top of the pyramid, which is a slow growth segment. It's, uh, it's uh, homogeneous. It's cosmopolitan. The same individuals could equally well be walking along a street in Paris or London. And they have high-end tastes. And they're influenced by global trends. On the other hand, you have this larger segment, which is expanding very rapidly, which is the middle and base of the pyramid, the MOP or the BOP, as opposed to the TOP. This is a high growth segment, heterogeneous and mass market in nature. And this is a customer space duality, which will pervade structural and behavioral dimensions of what we would see as an inclusion opportunity. The small eyeball and the mass around it. And here comes the concept of value adaptation. Another learning that the team and I worked through at the early stages as an affordability innovation strategy. So you start with your core product and let's first explore the obvious. You enhance that product, you value add to it, you have features, options, and you cater to broadly the tip of that iceberg, the eyeball in the eye of the consumer and address the high spend, high functionality, and aspirational positioning, which the exclusive consumers would require. But at the same time, if you are following an inclusive construct, you take the same product and you engineer a restricted version of it. And this we call value adaptation, not addition. And you adapt the value to enable low spend consumers to also experience that very same product at a lower entry point. But over time, this segment will upgrade in line with affordability, in line with prioritization of their spending needs and their movement in the share of wallet. So take that example that the, sun, the user of that sun silk sachet as a restricted or value adapted product will over time when he or she begins to earn more, put more priority on personal hygiene or on um, personal products, upgrade to the bigger bottle, the larger bottle. And the same could happen to Nescafe. Now, whether those sachets were made for the reason I described in terms of giving joy and giving aspiration, we don't know. They could well have been made purely to tease consumers into upgrading over time. But let's not conclude on that. The end result is that these are inclusive products. But something to remember, and an important concept here, is inclusion should not be confused with budget X. It's not just selling to the BOP. It's not creating an inferior biscuit for the bottom of the pyramid. What is important in inclusion is that you address the TOP, the MOP, and the BOP at the same time with different degrees of value adaptation. And you create a bridge which enables people to talk, to communicate, to appreciate the same brand, to appreciate and aspire to the same feelings, to be empathetic for each other across this socioeconomic pyramid, and to co-create business. So there's a very large difference between selling a budget product to the bottom of the pyramid and selling the same product with a lot of engineering, care, and effort to make the same product relevant, affordable, available, and culturally aligned 
to all segments of society. And taking that thought a little further, there are therefore should be no poor man brands. So I think the time is past when you would or should segment the market as I have shown here on the left, where you use SEC or socioeconomic category-based segmentation. But if you're segmenting, you need to segment based on lifestyle or stage and build brands which are TOP to BOP inclusive. And look at the world around us. The biggest brands in the world today are monolithic. There is no Facebook for the rich and Facebook for the poor. It's monolithic. There's no dialogue for the rich and dialogue for the poor. It's monolithic. So, inclusion, powerful, beautiful concept, a simple construct. Now, how do we create value? Which is a business fundamental. No CEO will last for too long, inclusion or exclusion aside, if value is not developed, if value is not created. And this is where there is a lot of science, product and business engineering, in order to translate the simple construct of inclusion with the power it has into business value creation. This would differ from industry to industry, but very broadly, one fundamental is around service fragmentation or product fragmentation or concept fragmentation to the smallest unit of production. You need to start thinking about, in our, in our industry, every minute and every gigabyte. In, the, in, in a manufacturing industry, to the smallest unit of production. In a, in a, in a consumer product uh, industry, to that smallest sachet, the smallest piece. And therefore, once you start fragmenting, you then need to work on the cost structure, to variableize your cost structure, meaning that you make your costs as proportional as possible to the volumes. A linear relationship with minimum overhead. Therefore, you must eliminate the minimum spend that you're enforcing on your consumer. You must reduce the minimum cost of adopting your service and you have to eliminate underutilization. Because if you have underutilized capacity in your factory or your network or in your service proposition, your overheads would be higher per unit. And therefore, successful inclusive businesses run very close to their capacity, but with the agility to increase very rapidly. Financial KPIs, likewise. The inclusion-enabling inclusion formulation will push you towards worrying about absolutes versus margins. Remember, right at the beginning, when I mentioned that you, the exclusion formula applies a margin to your cost. Let's not think of margin. Let's think of absolute profit per unit. If you focus on absolute profit per unit and then multiply it by the maximum possible volume, that surely is more important because your absolute return would be much higher than a margin percentage. But at a unit level, at that single biscuit or single gigabyte or single minute or sachet of uh, something, per unit margins, cost versus revenue. But how small can you make that unit? The smaller you do it, and the mathematicians would know about differential calculus. The smaller and smaller you go to infinity, the more precise your business construct would be. I'll move quickly to what I would call exponential times, because these are very relevant today. Exponential meaning the speed of change. And even 25 years ago, the speed of change seemed excessive. And at every stage of our life, I think change is too fast. So switching back even 25 years ago, we challenged ourselves whether we could drive this inclusion-based business construct on the basis of technology and innovation 
which was what we were, because we were bringing to Sri Lanka the latest mobile network, the GSM, or the first digital network in the whole of South Asia. So isn't there a conflict between technology and inclusive business modeling? Technology is, in fact, a great social level. Nice to say over the years that all people are equal in front of God and in front of technology. And when you think about it, why are new technologies invented? What gets them off the bench? Why do people put money behind technology? Because they are lower cost, they're smaller, they offer greater flexibility, address more needs. And if you sum this up, lower cost gives wider affordability, greater flexibility addresses more needs. Surely, technology must make things available and useful to more people. Technology is inclusive. And while I would be open to debate on any of the thoughts that I have shared, this is one where I believe there's only one truth, that technology is inclusive. And technology should be placed only in the hands of people, innovators, thinkers, who do believe that, and use technology in an inclusive manner to make life better for as many people as possible. And in a South Asian developing country context, technology is also hope. It is capability, something that you can't do with your hand, you can now do with technology. It's a positive feeling. It's not a negative feeling. It's an expression of equality. And technology is tomorrow and the future. And this is what links to Dialogue's brand promise of the future today. Not the neon lights, not the fast speeds, not being ahead of the technology curve year in, year out, over the last 25 years. But the fact that technology was used in an inclusive way to create futures for as many people as possible. And we realize that the national challenge is not the threat of a digital divide, but the opportunity for a digital bridge. And going back to that concept of value adaptation, so was created this bifocal opportunity with digital. And increasingly, we see it today. And I'll talk a little bit uh, towards the end about the latest trends in digital and innovation. Digital transformation can be used to deliver value adaptation. And I'll explain why in a moment. Because value adaptation is sometimes far more complex than value addition. It takes much more innovation, much greater thinking and finer tech to value adapt, to personalize, to make things unique for people according to their affordability, according to their preference. And indeed, digital will provide that bridge which earlier we marked as a segment upgrade, which would move the lower end of the SEC enjoying a value adapted product through digital technology. And with this digital bridge, they would move and advance and be empowered into fully fledged citizens of a digital world. Unless you include people at the early stages of digital transformation, they will not be a part of the digital story of any nation. And here in Sri Lanka, I think not only Dialog, all mobile players have, and even fixed line players have proven that the Mudalali in the furthest part of this country is able to carry out digital transactions for their consumers, to book a medical appointment, to transfer money, to do a top up, all digital transformation using a, the digital uh, transactions, using a menu, using instant real-time technologies. And we can be proud as a nation that this cycle is actually happening. And if we extend this concept to micro X, and what I have drawn out here are some examples from micro financial services. Digital technology enables insurance to be sold in small pieces. Instead of having to pay monthly or annual premium, 
Now you can buy insurance per day. And this was one of the first steps we took beyond mobile to experiment with the inclusion formula of breaking a product which had a minimum spend dictated to the consumer to break it up into small pieces. Likewise, micro lending. Lend to people with a credit rating or a credit capability for a small amount and build their lending or borrowing habit safely. Technology enables this. Micro savings, micro trading, and of course micro payment with mobile payment and other systems which allow small amounts of money to be transacted conveniently directly from the phone. And that same Mudalali or corner store owner to be the equivalent of a bank teller for that small transaction. Here comes a fundamental, that to enable all that micro X, to enable that sacheting through technology, sacheting of a variety of services, to enable the inclusion of every segment of society in the digital future, proportionality as a concept is key. And this relates to regulation, this relates to the complexity of that transaction, and the risk associated with that transaction. So the call out here is that not only do businesses need to innovate, to create inclusive business constructs and to include all segments of society, but regulators also need to enable a risk proportional regulatory environment so that the regulatory restrictions and conditions that are placed on a 10 rupee transfer across the country in a flash of a second, or even a thousand rupee transfer from the furthest part of Sri Lanka to the city, or vice versa, or the payment of a micro insurance policy at five rupees a day. The regulation of those services should be not as cumbersome as the regulation on complex million rupee transactions. So everybody needs to think innovatively and think inclusively. And extend in this, once you have this digital bridge in place, once you have proportional regulation, you can think of commerce, payments, education, information, e-government, market access, stock trading. Think of any service which is digital. There will be a way through innovation and proportional regulation to make it available, affordable, relevant, and culturally aligned to the poorest segments of the country. We are talking there about the Millennium Development Goals. We are talking about socio-economic development. But if we are to effect a radical shift in socio-economic development, a, a quantum shift, then we need to exploit a discontinuity and to do that with inclusive impact. So what is the discontinuity around the corn? It's the next wave of exponential change. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that some of the mega trends, I have list listed only a few, but some of the mega trends center around web scale or the internet. The scalability which the internet provides. Both the scalability and the fragmentation. Because the internet is a, able to reach an individual with the same efficacy as it can reach an enterprise, as it can reach a whole ecosystem of players within a certain industry. The same way it can connect an entire social network of billions of people. And the other phenomenon, which is around the corner, or we are already in it, is the Industrial Revolution 4.0. Globalization. And the importance of ecosystems, meaning that you don't do business on your own. You're always a part of a network. And the scalability of the internet and the web, the term web scale, meaning can you multiply whatever you're doing by millions and billions, are important concepts which we need to internalize if we are to win in this digital age. On the inclusion angle, what, this, what these megatrends deliver are economies without scale. So that tech, in fact, eliminates size and scale disadvantages 
normally burdensome on small entities, on individuals, on small traders. The internet has made it possible for a small trader to compete head on with an enterprise. And that is what economies, of, uh, economies without scale mean. Likewise, competitiveness has been re redefined. How you build competitive advantage today is not by size, not by bullying your competition, but by making smart partnerships and connecting smart across this inclusive environment called the internet. With respect to IR4, it's important to trace through the various revolutions of technology to see whether there are some learnings, some learnings based on which we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. The first industrial revolution or mechanization, the steam engine uh, and the steam uh, uh, mari maritime travel using steamboat. Second industrial revolution in the 19th century, mass production and electrification. The third industrial revolution, the mid 20th century, computers, automation, networks, all the way to a few years ago. And now industrial revolution 4.0 cyber-physical systems. Let's take a minute to ponder on how these industrial revolutions aided or opposed inclusion. The first two created major divides across the globe, resulted in huge rich-poor divides at national level and within nations as well, resulted in colonization, in dominance, and created a very fractured world. Industrial Revolution Three also went down that same road, and we would all remember the term digital divide, because computers and automation were just like their predecessors in Industrial Revolution One and Two, dividing the world as opposed to bringing people together. And I believe it was only the la last phase of Industrial Revolution 3.0 where the computer transformed into a mobile phone. And the mobile phone became available and affordable to billions of people. And that is where I must qualify that whatever I have spoken to you about was also done across the world. In Asia, Sri Lanka was ahead. And, but it, these are phenomena which people realized over time and the whole world moved in that direction. So today we have the cyber physical system before us. What are we going to do with these systems? Are we going to drive inclusion or are we allow, going to allow exclusion and the fracturing of the global landscape? It's an opportunity and a threat because technologies engender divides between adopters and laggards. Those who are late can get left behind. And therefore, if you embrace, you can elevate your productivity and competitiveness. And if you are a laggard, it will deplete your competitive advantage. IR 4.0 has many amazing technologies. The Internet of Things, basically sensors, artificial intelligence, robotics, blockchain technologies, which are distributed, vastly distributed, massively distributed computing networks. 5G, the cloud. As a technologist, I would name all these as being inclusive. But I would qualify that statement by saying it depends on who uses them and how these technologies are used. And therefore, I would put into the four A's of inclusion a fifth A, and that is amplification. That whoever has these technologies in their hand, who is fortunate enough to have access, that they must think in addition to the four A's also, how am I going to amplify the impact and the magnitude of the impact of this technology through web scale, meaning millions and billions, so that the world becomes advanced together. Because the outcome of exclusion is division. And I don't need to remind you about this. The digital divide, access asymmetries, wealth gradients, and opportunity gradients. And with the fourth IR and 5G, there is a marked difference. 
to all the other industrial revolutions prior. And that is that while many of the others, especially Industrial Revolution 3.0 and the mobile phone, where they <coughs> touched consumers, IR 4.0, very much like the first and the second industrial revolutions, are going to touch industry. They're going to move the lever of wireless technology to the very epicenter of national economies and their global competitiveness. In short, what I'm trying to say is that if a country is late in using this IR4 technologies within their industries and services, manufacturing and service industries, they would be globally behind. Just like the adopters of the steam engine were left behind, not for any fault of their own, but due to imperialism. But this time, this technology is there, and we should have the foresight to make sure that poorer nations, producing nations, manufacturing nations, get and incorporate these technologies early so that they could prevent any further fracturing of the rich-poor divide across the group. Absence would determine competitiveness of a nation's economy, wealth, and human development gradients across societies. And indeed, we might foresee, but we should prevent at all costs a digital divide 4.0. So while we envision robots in the manufacturing space, while we envision robotics-led surgeries from across the world, while we envision driverless cars, while we envision agriculture productivity being increased manifold due to IoT technologies, Internet of Things, sensors, which can sense the soil, sense the weather, sense the every aspect of agriculture, making it a mechanized industry. Those who have and those who have not will be subject to a divide which is more stark than Industrial Revolution 3.0 and could be as stark as way back in the ages of the steam engine or electrification and colonization. On the brighter side, if I just look at wireless connectivity, global studies showed that making wireless connectivity, meaning mobile, inclusive, available, affordable to everyone in the population, delivered a 4x multiplier on the investment in terms of end user surplus. It is also said that the inclusive application of IR 4.0, the emerging technologies today, will give you a 100x multiplier on investment because they would contribute directly to productivity and competitiveness of industrial and service economies. So it's not only about mass production. Think about consumer choice and what I would call inclusion 4.0, which is based on these advancing technologies. Deep inclusion or the digital twin is just an example. Artificial intelligence, big data, has made it possible and feasible for organizations to build digital twins of their consumers, of their employees, of, their, of the products they manufacture, of their machinery. So in the case of machinery, you would have a digital twin of a machine that you have installed in a remote location. You would know exactly how that machine is behaving by observing the digital twin. So it's a powerful concept that these fourth IR technologies will enable you remotely to engage. And likewise, you could do hyper-personalization or micro-personalization of your products to the poorest of your consumers. And that I would call inclusion 4.0. Because it's not now, it's not about saying, here is a product, it's cheap, but no choice. You have to buy this without any personalization. These technologies will give you the power to personalize in the most inclusive degree possible. So over 25 years, 
the context of inclusion has expanded. We started thinking about making the opportunity to consume affordable and available to as many people as possible. Move to experience, to participation, the opportunity to influence outcomes, to build, to own, and all the way to creating economic value. And today, inclusion is a powerful word, much used. And that's why when I chose this topic, I wondered whether I was talking about something which was so obvious. And indeed, the concept of inclusion goes well beyond products. And it goes to the enterprise level in terms of are you inclusive in your talent development, growth, scale, profitability, ecosystems, the diversity of your ecosystem, the scale and the impact, and the national socioeconomic. How do you drive competitiveness GDP, consumer surplus, the multiplier I mentioned through inclusion. How do you reduce your Gini coefficient, the rich-poor gap? How do you improve your human development indices through inclusion? So this word inclusion is, and the, the sphere through which it can create value is now phenomenal. But the beginnings were very simple. And over time, it has also moved into employment, shareholding, beneficiaries, geographic and demographic outreach. And indeed, the impact of inclusion can be all pervading. We talked about sales growth of mass market business models. We talked about examples of how do you create business value. It has become corporate strategy, and in, I'll mention that very shortly, that it can be the very strategy of a corporate at the at the depths of the business. It can create disruption. It can drive national competitiveness compare, combined with the right technologies. And it is indeed an emerging form of capitalism. So inclusion, I believe, has transitioned from doubted to obvious, from unappreciated to a buzzword and a tick box. Having grappled with this concept, debated it with Professor Udita on many occasions. Over 25 years, I have seen this transition from a way of concept to being obvious, and today it's a buzzword. Nearly all corporates would have in their list of to-do things to tick the box that they must be inclusive. But I think you need to go beyond ticking the box if you are to benefit and enjoy the fruits of inclusion. Inclusion needs to be a business paradigm and an institutional constant. It cannot be another box to tick. And business integral inclusion, as I would call it, is very similar to scalability because you structure your business in a way that addresses not an exclusive segment but makes the product or service or proposition or employment opportunity, or whatever it is, to everyone. And therefore, you're scalable. This is a modern word. It's a word that is a buzzword today. Uh, in a boardroom, in an investor, in a investor challenge, they'll always say, can you scale your business? Does it mean is your business inclusive? I think it does. Likewise, is it the ultimate nirvana of sustainability? And I believe Professor Udithalianige believed this. And this is where he placed inclusion as the ultimate of sustainability. If you have one customer giving you one million rupees, or a million customers giving you one rupee each, which is more sustainable? Which would give you safety in diversity? Which would be give you a higher contribution towards socioeconomic development? It is also, I believe, the nirvana of sustainability. And the concept of web scale, eyeball valuation models, I'm just reminding you of things which you all know. This is the reality today. Businesses are valued by, not by margins, they are valued by the number of consumers, Facebook, the eyeballs, Google, any of these internet age, 
conglomerates of internet age mahimas. They are valued on web scale dimension. So inclusion as a value creation strategy, no longer blue ocean. I started off saying, we stumbled upon it 25 years ago, humble beginnings in a small country. And indeed, it, parallel thinking across the world, many people would have stumbled upon it. But doesn't take away the beauty and the power of this concept. The leaderboards have refreshed. It's not a consistent picture, but if you go into the fundamentals, I think many of those who have overtaken their predecessors rapidly and come to the top at valuations far greater than their predecessors have internalized inclusion. Business integral inclusion, not the tick box. And our very example, own example in Sri Lanka, starting as a number four last entrant, the first profit in 98, the mobile market leader on target in 2000, the largest IPO, a one billion market cap in 2005, the largest converged telco leader across fixed and television and mobile in 2013, today the most valuable brand in Sri Lanka. Over 20 years of market leadership. And I believe the only lesson here, I'm not, I didn't put this up to uh, brag about what we as a team achieved, but to exemplify and motivate that by including, by bringing every single Sri Lankan consumer into your business strategy, that nothing is impossible. But there are some negative outcomes we need to be careful about. Inclusion translates to everyone. And if someone can acquire everyone, you become a new age monopoly. And globally, we are seeing this today. There are new age monopolies. New age monopolies created by whom? By consumers themselves. Not by barriers, not by governments, not by anything other than consumer vote. And consumers have created. And that's one aspect to be careful about. Unbridled consumption. Also, whether the consumption that is being created is sustainable. And can inclusion translate to invasion? Because with modern technology, if inclusion is not regulated or, or not paralleled by regulations around privacy, around data protection, inclusion would also translate to invasion of privacy of nations, of enterprises, of individuals. So there's no getting away from the diligent focus we must have on ethics, net footprint, environmental impact, so that we ensure that inclusion translates to sustainable development. The strategy of inclusion, making the opportunity to participate and experience available and affordable to as many as possible. I'm repeating this again. And I ask you, is this a modern form of socialism or is it inclusive capitalism? I like to feel that it is novo socialism. And I believe you'll choose either of these and I sincerely believe neither is wrong, neither is bad. And it pivots on the intent with which you started. If you start with the intent of making everybody equal, then I think it's novo socialism. If you use the most modern tools to make everybody equal, and progress everybody to the highest platform possible, it is novo socialism. But if you start with the objective of capital growth alone, but quickly realize or soon realize that the only route to capital growth and sustainable capital growth is business integral inclusion, then we have inclusive capitalism. I believe both have the same credibility, the same heart and are equally laudable. And in fact, the World Economic Forum has spelled out stakeholder capitalism, which eliminates the contradiction between capital growth and outreach, availability, capital growth and social and environmental development outcomes, sustainability, 
capital growth and plural impact inclusion. And this is, I think, synonymous with inclusive capitalism. So we have come a long way. The World Economic Forum has defined the new era of capitalism as being stakeholder capitalism or inclusive capitalism. From a faint concept believed by few decades ago. And if you look at our very nation, the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, look at those powerful words. Equality is democracy. Inclusion, socialism. And I believe embedded in this, Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka has to be a firm commitment to inclusion. And therefore, I might ask, indeed, is inclusion a fundamental right? Can someone say, I have a right? Can a small business say, I have a right to be included in the plans of the nation, of the enterprise, of the individual? And we must really understand, and why I'm going there, taking a slightly socio-political twist to this topic because it has gone through so many phases, is that when inclusion is deficit, you will find disparity. And where there's disparity, you will find exploitary politics. Because when there are haves and have-nots, the promise of equality is cheap, and the promise of equality and inclusion can deceive. And gives rise to patronage, which we all complain about in the business world, and selective inclusion it will ultimately result in instability and disarmament. So the business world must ensure, without complaining about patronage, about politics, about dysfunctional systems, the business world has a lot to do. Because if we play our part in having inclusion at the heart of our business, at the heart of our value creation construct, I believe we'll eliminate these deficits. And if we eliminate these deficits, the room for politics or any other form of disruption to norms, to stability and harmony and love for each other will be eliminated. So finally, in summary, inclusion, I believe, creates value, business value money, shareholder value, seeds scalability, greatly aided by today's technologies, shapes a new form of capitalism, is the nirvana of sustainability, and creates a more equal world and a more equal nation. And I believe that the business world has all the tools to make this happen one, two, or all of these. And that way, I think, we will create value through inclusion. And we will also create a better world. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where I see the nexus, the coming together of value creation and inclusion to create a better world, not just by ticking a box or doing good once in a while, but by embedding that desire to include at the heart of your business, however small or large it may be. I thank you for your patient hearing, and I hope I've been able to share a few thoughts, learnings, and I would like to thank Professor Udita, the late Professor Udita Lienege for the many opportunities he gave me to share the debate and learn from him, and it has been a humbling experience for me to be here today. And I would also like to thank all those over the years who have taught me many, many lessons. Last but not least, my own team and the Sri Lankan consumer. Thank you.